This will be message number eight in a series of messages. And I always have this kind of reluctant reluctancy to, to get into a, a series because I know periodically I want to uh, jump in and do something else to kind of break it up. But then I always have to pray about it <laughs> to make sure that's actually what I'm supposed to be doing. So it creates a lot of interesting conversations between me and God. But that's just a, an important detail for you, right? Okay. So as I said, this is the eighth uh, in a series of messages on the subject of holiness and sanctification, which we can at least ascertain that it is a complex subject. Um, so we've started through the, New Test- through the Old Testament, and I've told you the largest concentration of our Hebrew words will be occurring in Exodus and Leviticus, and then as you travel outside of the Pentateuch, uh, first five books of the Bible, less and less and in different uses. I actually spent the week um, in my studies analyzing, and I'm hoping I will get to it today, I may not, so we'll see, analyzing the use of the Hebrew word uh, for holy or sanctify uh, within the Psalms. And that analysis for me was very revelatory because what it did, and sorry, if you're not an analytical person, this won't be for you, but this is the only way, in my opinion, to be able to understand this subject. You've got to analyze everything. And proper uh, scriptural exegesis isn't throwing a bunch of stuff in the pot and and mixing it up. Proper scriptural exegesis may be spending an hour over a punctuation, which I've done before, because we're dealing with secondhand what is the English version or translation, which is maybe far, at times we've seen, away from the intent of the original language and its writer. So that being said... One of the ways that I feel we can glean a little bit is looking at the hallowed name of God. And why is that important? Because right there in, if you want to take a look, you'll see it in Exodus 31 and, let's see here, 31 and 13. And the reason why this is very important is because in Exodus 31 and 13, you actually have a name of God. And I should stop right here because there's people that have come along and might say, hey, name of God. Well, of course, it says, Lord, I am the Lord. But from the Hebrew, in especially in the Pentateuch, we have God revealing himself. I taught on this before. Sometimes he reveals his name to the individual. Other times, his actions that he has done in the midst of something become what the individuals now call on the name of God. Like, for example, Hagar, when she was at the well and she said she knew that the the Lord had seen the trouble of her and her son, and she calls that and says, he's the Lord that sees. And that becomes one of God's names. And, of course, we know when we start studying the Bible, the Name in creation, for example, in the beginning God, that in the beginning God, which we know our Hebrew is Elohim. And if you've studied Hebrew, you're familiar with it. Elohim, which is the name of God. Um, One of the names of God, as he's revealed in creation, is the majestic plural that im at the end puts it in the plural. It is the plurality of the Godhead in creation. In fact, there are so many names of God in the book, and remarkably, I don't know why this is, but a lot of them were either revealed to Abraham or Abraham called on the name of the Lord in a certain way depending on the relationship. And this understanding the names of God, and specifically this name that appears in Exodus 31, 13, um, helps us to get glimpses into the attributes and the heart of God because, yes, we have his word, but we also have God's actions. So if we combine these two factors, we end up with something really great. 
So first let's talk about what's in Exodus 31.13. That uh, where it says that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. But in the Hebrew, it is simply Yahweh, or as some people would say Jehovah, but it's Yahweh. And the word is from our Kadesh, Mikadeshu, Mikadeshnu, or depending on the end of it. But it is, the, it is the name of God, much like Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is our peace. Uh, and if you think about it, we tend to also take those names and we don't necessarily see them in context. Jehovah Shalom was something that Gideon uttered and referred to. Well, take a look at how we meet Gideon. He's threshing wheat in a wine press somewhere, hiding, scared. So the word that is so applicable to him is essentially the Lord will be your peace or your portion or the Lord will bring calm or or the Lord will bring wholeness or restorative health, depending on how we're using the word shalom. So we've got a compound, Jehovah and Shalom, Jehovah Nisi. When the Israelites were going to go fight Amalek and they called on his name, Jehovah Nisi, that is the Lord your banner or the colloquial God will fight your battles for you. So you've, when we get to know dimensions of God, it actually changes the way we relate to him. Let me give you a flesh example. And it's going to fall terribly short, but there's always a change in relationship. So, for example, a man and woman are dating their boyfriend and girlfriend, right? They get married. You may say, well, that's the way we refer to things in our language. Yes, but instead of boyfriend and girlfriend, they're now husband and wife. And their relating to each other may not have changed, per se, in the jump from dating to marriage, but legally Usually, something changes. And then, let's just say they have a child. Now there's another name that comes on the mother and father of the child. And there is a relational difference that occurs because prior to that child coming into being, there was no relating in that capacity. There wasn't any relation of that nature to be had. So, when we relate to God, sorry, I told you it would fall terribly short, but it is, there is a a way of relating to God when we understand sometimes God reveals himself a certain way in our need, and in that need, he reveals, he knows what we need. He'll reveal himself in that way. So, for example, when we talk about the scripture in Exodus where it says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, Jehovah Rophi, that healing nature of God. Well, look at the context when it says about, I will put none of those diseases which I put upon the Egyptians. And in in that context, that name of God is uttered, which tells me something. God is not just able to heal when you're sick, but he's also able to keep you whole. That's a super important point there. So getting to know the names of God and what they mean when we come to this compound where we have the translation in Exodus 31, 13 of, I am the Lord that doth sanctify you, really they should have translated it in a way like the rest of the names of God so that when we see, for example, I'm giving another Abraham example of um, Genesis 22. Take, Take your son, your only begotten son, go and sacrifice him on the mount. And in that, in that way, when God revealed himself by providing another sacrifice, he becomes known, Abraham knows God as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord did provide. Also, there's a double meaning there because there's also prophecy of a future time that it will be seen in the mount referring to Christ, referring to God in in the Pentateuch and Christ in the future. So what I'm saying to you is, is it's through these names that we get to know more about God and we get to understand more of his nature. And even the people in the book... Uh, again, I used a flesh example, but probably a better example would be out of the book. You know, we say David was a man after God's own heart. But David is also known as shepherd. So you, you glean insight from the names that we have of David. He was a shepherd. We know that he tended the flock, right? He was king. He was poet. He wrote a lot of the Psalms. He was a musician. So you can glean 
dimensions of David's personality and the, the qualities that he possessed by the things we knew him by, or the names that he might have been known by, specifically, for example, the king. So the same way is true with God. So when we talk about the holiness of God, the first thing we have to talk about is the Lord. And I'm, I'm now going to try and hone in on these words a little bit more because we've been using very kind of sloppy and generic terms because it's, we haven't fit anything into a box yet. I don't think we can, but we're going to try and make it a little bit easier and neater. With somebody, for example, if we're looking at this, the Lord that sanctifies, there can never be a time, even when you and I read in Scripture where it says, sanctify yourselves, there can never be a time where you or I do anything of the sort apart from God. These are the great things that have been so totally confused. I told you, if you want to know what this subject is not, it is not about being perfect. It is not about purity. This led to a whole movement, um, the holiness movement, and I was just reading um, an extensive article on really the, how um, John Wesley understood, because he had a great impact on the holiness movement, how he understood sanctification. And it's, it's very interesting. His take was that everything happens instantaneously and immediately, but they coined the term, which you've heard here before, second definite work of grace. Or another scholar at a later time called it second crisis. Now, I don't know why you'd call something a second crisis, and how could you have a second definite work of grace, and somebody else calls it a second crisis doesn't sound like the same event to me, but there, there is no second definite work of grace. Now, those people will say, oh, she's crazy, but the reason why is there is nothing in the Bible that could even lead you or I to believe that. Now, the reality is there's always a kernel of truth somewhere, so the devil's in the details, I guess. When we talk about sanctification, there has to be an initiator. He is from this name. He's the Lord that sanctifies. He's the doer. He's the activator. He is the one that initiates. With that being said, there are also people who say that not only is it instantaneous, it is complete, and it is permanent. And those people also belong to the category that says, once saved, always saved. And you can never lose your salvation, which I do not adhere to that Um, theology whatsoever, because I have seen more people in my Christian lifetime make a shipwreck and leave the faith because. So, and then don't go in the argument, well, then they weren't saved to begin with. That's, we're not buying that. So, why did I go through all of this about the titles of God? Because it becomes clear that when we see this and we're going to call it for right now an attribute or a dimension of God that just like the Lord that heals and just like the Lord that provides, he is the Lord that sanctifies. Now, would you or I have the audacity, if we're talking about the things of God, and this I don't want to mix secular or carnal, we're only talking about the things of God, I think it would be pretty blasphemous to say that you or I are able to, in the biblical sense, separate ourselves because it is God that must do that work. And it is a work that if you look carefully enough in the pages, and I have enough lessons, I think, to make the examples for this, you're going to see that the first thing we absolutely unequivocally know is that when God does set someone apart, when he does call and say, I'm going to use you for a task, like Moses delivering the children of Israel, like Abraham having to go into the land, like Jacob. I can keep going with the examples, but he calls with a definitive purpose. It's not ambiguous. It's not vague. And when he begins the work, you can look at the people I've just mentioned, and let's just say Jacob is one of them. Let's just say from the crippling of Jacob at the Ford Jabbok, right, when he wrestled with the Lord, with the angel of the Lord, Can anyone honestly look at the rest of Jacob's life from that point forward and say, when Jacob never veered off the pathway whatsoever? 
the nature of the individual, you can say that's, it took Christ coming to bring on and go from a concept to a reality of a new man or a new creature in Christ. Prior to that, there was no such thing. So what you have is a person's behavior that could be altered by this life-changing moment of the crippling of Jacob. And believe me, this would remind you every day of the rat that you were as you limp along in life. But there are enough signs within the book of Genesis to tell me that Jacob did not, he might have received a new name, Israel, but he did not have a cleansed, completely perfect, brand new, realized, like a a car that's never been driven personality. Okay, you get what I'm saying. So it, it is important to see why these type of studies matter. Now, one of the things I wanted to do before I leave the Exodus 31 13 is just talk to you a little bit about this compound name, which you cannot see here, but the Lord, that any time, this is old school for most of you here, any time you read capitalized L-O-R-D, that is going to be referring to Jehovah. And any time you read capital L and the rest in small, it is usually referring to translating the word Adonai. And this is kind of interesting because anywhere where you are reading this term for Lord, Adonai, we tend to lessen it because Adonai can carry with it an individual. You could, in in the biblical days, you could call an individual Lord, my Lord, referring to, and this is what's important, this was often used with regard to master and servant, and which is quite common in the Bible. So that word, Adonai, is, it is normally used of relationships that way. Um, this word, Lord, capital, all capitals, that is translating Jehovah, which is translating the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is referred to, the technical term is the sacred tetragrammatron, which is the four letters that cannot be pronounced because for the Jewish people it is too sacred, too holy to pronounce And therefore, some of the Targums and some of the earlier writing won't even have Yahweh spelt out, won't even have that. They'll simply have this, Yahya, because they felt by doing this type of an abbreviation that they would be um, not, they're not saying the word. But here's the mind-boggling thing. When Moses asked God who should I say sent me? And he said, you tell him I am. And we, you know, there's kind of that, because of our language, I am sent you. But what God was saying in the form of I am, Jehovah, he was saying, I am everything, and I am above everything, and I am in everything. I am the source. I am the self-existent everything for the universe. This is, why, this is why it's mind-boggling that a whole group of people chose to never call on that name when God specifically said, you tell him who sent you. You speak my name. You tell him who sent you. This name brings you into the New Testament when Paul is talking about a name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So why... This is important. And when I'm talking about the names of God, I want to make sure I had to put this in in passing. Somebody will say, you know, what about taking the Lord's name in vain? We'll get to that. We're going to cover as much as I can on the subject, but I, I don't want to lose sight of what I'm doing here. So remember, I'm trying to look at the words that will bring us. We're looking at the compound of Jehovah. He's the one, the Lord that sanctifies. So, Let me go back to the definition of, and it's very hard because I don't really think we can define, but we can, we can say uh, examples or the essence of. So for Jehovah in the compound, remember if if Jehovah is representing the God that is, that is and that will be the God that declared I am, that I am not just in existence, but that I am above everything else, and I am the Elohim of creation, 
and I am, if you will, for all the things that I've made in the earth, he is Adonai. He is the master of the universe. He's the master of everything. So in all of these words, we, we get the gleaning of the greatness, the magnitude of God, and then you add your compound. So if we have the self-existent, I am above everything, and now we have, add the word sanctifier. I am the one that sanctifies you. Then the one who is, who is above all, who possesses in himself everything, who is all in all, also possesses the ability to set you apart. And then that process of the setting apart begins what we're referring to as sanctification. Now, in the Old Testament, people had to go through all of these rituals. When God made a statement and he declared, for example, to Moses, go and sprinkle the people with blood or with water, with oil, this method of pronouncing by ceremony, which, which possesses water, blood, and oil, which will be made clear to us of why God chose these three elements. They are there in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. What we have in the New Testament to help us with our understanding, the Old Testament didn't give us. The Old Testament gave us the exterior, the relational, positional relationship with God that God desired in the New Testament. He gives us the ability by positioning from within, which is why when we talk about the gift that God gives, starting on the day of Pentecost with the Holy Spirit, we get insight into how the process happens. Now, some of you who have started reading books, maybe you found interesting books that you think are fascinating, but there's a lot of confusion even where you pick up here. Because what exactly should we understand this term, once we move into the New Testament, how is the operation, how is it happening, and what is happening? And I've said this before because I think that this is the missing ingredient for a lot of people. It does not. This process that God is doing in you or doing in me does not make me perfect or pure or whatever it is that people have added on as an exterior. What it does is it makes me fit for that particular moment in time, for service. So the next question is, what about the references in the Bible to the saints? In the Psalms, that's why I told you I spent the week studying the use of the Hebrew word in the Psalms. My findings were very interesting. In the Psalms, there has been a shift. So from the Pentateuch, we see all of the ceremonial, we see we'll call it man's striving. It looks like people are going through the ritual and the ceremony, but you can also see behind the ritual and the ceremony, people are, they still falter. So even though something is declared to be, an individual is declared to be, they may still falter. They may still not perform their duties as God instructed. There are a lot of issues that can happen because of free will. So, I'm, I'm taking all this and I'm recognizing something that I think, as I said, into the Psalms, we don't have any of this ceremonial towards individuals. And I thought that was really fascinating because the mention in Psalms is, I'll read you, and you can kind of, in your own time, you can go through the Psalter, the book of Psalms, and highlight or circle, maybe take your concordance. But hear how these, I'm just going to read how, I'm not even going to read the chapter and verse, but these are the references in the Psalms. Holy hill, holy temple, um, sanctuary, holy heaven, holy place, holy oracle, beauty of holiness. These are the bulk of the references. And when it is referring, so those are all God word, okay? When it refers to the same Hebrew word as referring to the people throughout the Psalter, it now is saying saints. They're translating the same word now, and they're calling the individual fathers saints, which is the same word as what is being used for holy, holiness, 
and uh, did I have one more? Sanctuary. They're the same words. So what I'm trying to tell you is definitely when you leave the Pentateuch, you really do start to see the change. And some of that also will be in the way things are being described as Ezra, Nehemiah, and some of the other books that have scant references to this word, you're going to be reading in your Bibles, dedicate. It will, there's less and less of the words being used that we encountered in the Pentateuch and more and more to dedicate. And by the way, Jeremiah has a bunch of these same words, but they are not translated like any other word. So don't ask me because I haven't figured that one out yet. All right. So why am I sharing this with you? Because I don't want you to leave here today thinking that I've just described God as Alan Dershowitz's, you know, God's making it up as he goes and he's experimenting and he's trying to get it right and he'll finally get it right eventually. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the writers, though, which... Tell, it tells me it's a great revelation to see that by the time the Psalter is being written, and we've definitely got at least um, an easy thousand plus years, and that's minimally, okay? You can see how man, even though inspired by God to write, the mindset and the application and the use of the word is changing. Man's use of the word, not God's. This is what's important. Because as you travel into the New Testament, you've gone through the Old Testament and you study all the examples, you come to realize by the close of the canon, the book of Malachi, Malachi is all about the priesthood, the corruptness of the priesthood. And these were people who were separated to God for God's service. And yet the whole book is about the disobedience of, of those who are supposedly the holy, committed, dedicated, consecrated, sanctified ones. There, I said it. So I think the, the thing that I would really uh, recommend if you have been studying and going through your concordance, but definitely I want to I highlight this shift because, as I said, what keeps coming back in my mind is there are passages that we'll have to deal with singularly, the one I referenced out of Matthew 6. But probably the, the, the thing that's begging, begging me, just get there, hurry up and get there, is what Jesus prays in John 17. Because what Jesus prays in John 17, let's, let's take a look at it. I want you to, we're, I'm not ready to teach on it, but I want us to just take a look, because I'm hoping that through these kind of, I'm going to call them cut-and-paste messages that we're, we are gaining insight. So take a look at John 17. And keep in the back of your mind, remember I said to you that this word, really apart from God, has little or no value. And we're not talking about the pagan gods or, or the pantheon of gods. We're talking about apart from Jehovah, the Lord, Apart from him, this way, the word has no meaning. We talk about sanctify or, or, or setting apart. It has no value. Um, and you can say, well, of course it has value, but I'm talking about biblically. It has no value apart from God. So um, John 17, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then again, he goes down, he says, and for their sakes... Sanctify, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So you can see here the rituals are gone. The shedding of blood happens at Calvary instead of as a daily sacrifice. The water and the oil that were being referred to, John in his letter will talk about God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the, we'll call it instrumentation But what is striking here is there's a big transition from the Old Testament where we had the ritual, we had something that immediately went to connect to that ritual, to now, what do we have? You stand here, and by faith, trusting Christ for your salvation, and by faith, this act that Jesus prays for, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, brings me back to a topic you cannot escape from. 
if you and I are studying the Word of God and the Word of God is in us, that means God's presence. I've never seen anybody be interested in God's Word that God's Spirit had not uh, opened the door first. I don't think it works any other way. If it does, it doesn't last. It's like the parable of the sower. But here, thy Word is truth. And earlier, he talks about the Word being able to cleanse, catharizo, to catharize, to clean. You are made clean through the word. So the process of all of this is happening as we open our eyes and our hearts and we're listening or reading the word and taking the word in, that the truth of God's word that is delivered to us by way of the spirit. There's no way that somebody will tell me, well, can somebody know the truth of God's word and not have the spirit of God? Like we're talking about somebody who's studying the word, who's in the word. Well, I've seen people learn the word, like memorize it and repeat it rotely, but there's nothing there. But I'm talking about what is, we'll call it the faith walk. So impossible for it to be any activity that I am doing, that God is doing to me. But the participating factor is what is here. Thy word is truth. I must expose myself to the word of God. I must take that word in. I must meditate, pray, converse with God. And it's in that activity that this process is happening. The taking me from where I am and the changes, the transition, the conforming to God's image and likeness that are occurring. Now, I ask you a question. This goes back to a lengthy article that actually bored me to tears um, about Wesley's understanding of, of, of this subject. And he was insistent that it was instantaneous, although later on in life, he, in, towards the end of his life, he actually changed his stance on the subject. And I want to say this to you. Somebody might say, well, that's pretty crummy. No, I'd say that's pretty honest. If you can humble yourself that if you find something, some truth of God in here that was not clear or plain to you before, it only makes you honest if you can step forward and say, no, it's really this. And some people might say, well, that would bring distrust. Not for me. I'd say that person genuinely wants me to know the truth they too have uncovered, which may have been an error earlier on, and, and we'll call it an error that was not intentional, right? So what I gleaned from, from his, that giant book that I was reading, and from the activity that I see here, is it cannot be, if I'm understanding this process to be bringing me into the image and likeness of Christ, the activity of God may be instantaneous in depositing his spirit in me, but the conforming to the image and likeness that does not happen in one fell swoop. It cannot be instantaneous and complete. Why Paul says, and I've repeated this now for the last few weeks, the God of peace shall wholly sanctify you over there, not here. So that tells me uh, something is started, which is not completed, which means anybody who is preaching that you can obtain complete and utter holiness in this lifetime, and we're talking about constant, ongoing I'm, I live in a bubble. I live in a monastery. I live in a cloister. I live in a shoebox. Okay? It's not happening. You cannot get, and I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. If you're reading the same book as I am, you cannot get someone who, we can be changed. And listen, God is God. He can do whatever he wants. If he wants to do that like that, he can do it, right? He's God. He doesn't need anyone's permission or understanding. But the point I'm driving at is, by and large, this process occurs, and it is ongoing, and it is not necessarily, and I've said this before, if you take a look at just the men that followed Christ closely, for which we have a chronicle of, for three and a half years that these men followed Christ, the book speaks for itself. If the process, and you can say, well, but Christ hadn't been crucified yet, and the Spirit, which was the promise of the Father, had not come. But while Christ was alive and in the flesh, he was all man and all God, and able to, mm, in, in, in dynamite, 
when he said, all power is given unto you. Now that's at the end, that's at the close of, but when they went to cast out demons or they went to do whatever they did, it's very clear that Jesus could impart and it would be for that particular mission or that assignment, but it didn't stay. The Whatever was imparted to them did not stay with them because three and a half years, which are chronicled more or less as an outline in this book, tell me that these men did not all of a sudden, when they decided to follow Jesus, when he said, follow me, and they said, okay, all right, here we go, right? That they were automatically, they, were, they came out like they were walking behind Jesus. They were like the Beatles, you know, walking across the street. And they were all looking the same, talking the same, acting the same, right? It didn't happen that way. So we need to be clear about this and not make it into a caricature. And, and I think in the process, many people have made a shipwreck of their own faith because you start looking at somebody else and they'll you know, tell their testimony or tell their great story. And, and the exterior trappings of someone who, you know, I don't, I don't say any of those words. Never. And, oh, no, I don't, I don't eat any of that food. I never take a drink in my life. Look, every, every digit is crossed right now. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is whatever somebody says, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, 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 you can say, yeah, you do. <laughs> and the reality is, I mean, this is the stuff we have to work out in honesty between, for each individual, between you and God. You know, putting on the facade and trying to make somebody like, mm, okay, not to, not to open up old wounds or anything, but, you know, it, listen, I, I decided a long time ago that I was going to wear black. And I wear black. You're saying, what does this have to do with what you're just saying? I'm going to tell you. I wear black because it's the easiest thing to coordinate with other people. I never have to worry about clashing. (laughs) And the only thing that can drive me crazy is when they don't adjust the blacks properly. So you have a couple of different, well, I probably have a different color of black every time you see me. But I'm not doing it for any other reason. Now, there are people who dress completely in white. Theirs is for another reason. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, that mindset that somehow the frock, this is, this, if you want to know where I'm coming from, I'm going to tell you. Somehow, when we see people of the cloth, specifically those dressed in regalia, dressed in white, purity. Okay, listen, go save that. The tabloid smoked you out a long time ago. The white didn't fool anybody. But my point is, it was holy. It was just holy somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I ain't going to tell you, okay? You'll be like, what was she talking about all day? I don't know. But here's the thing. That mindset precipitates that hypocritical, look at me and you will see. I, I have the beauty of the holiness of God And what does this look like anyway? Well, I can tell you what it must look like. God is like nothing we've ever seen in our lifetime. That's what it looks like. God is incomparable, not describable, even though I've been trying to give you the essence by his names, not definable, really not describable, other than what he has revealed to us. And the worst thing are those people who embody, they are the embodiment of what Jesus called out of the Pharisees those people who he called whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones on the inside, because there's nothing, there's no substance of God on the inside. I'd rather take a dirty container, and when I say dirty, I'm talking about sin-stained Adam container that I wear, and I'm not proud of it, but that's the container I was given. That's the container I have lived in for 51 years of my life, and the only thing that makes me clean or good or holy or set apart is what the Lord deemed to look down on me and say, let me pluck that one from the fire. I want that one, that particular one, that, that Melissa Scott one. I want that one. Put your name in there. From that, I don't get perfection. From that, I don't get purity. From that, I don't get anything. But I can glean from that. I can glean 
that I can get, I can actually find out the great question that Pilate asked, what is truth? But I can find out the truth through the scripture, and it is the word that is the truth that has the transformative power, and that power that is given to me by the Holy Spirit that brings the capacity for change on the inside to begin to occur. And that change is not necessarily, as I said, the conformity to Christ, yes, but also the ability to serve for a specific task at a set time, which is why God gave some pastors, some teachers, pastoring teachers, evangelists, prophets for the perfecting, the equipping of the saints, but he also called a body of people into the church, the church itself, who are people who belong to the Lord, and those people, remember I talked about dating the husband and wife, the the relationship change. The relational change here is that I'm no longer trying to give the appearance of something. In fact, I find the more I trust in God and the more I'm fading in the book, I can be I can be me. I don't have to put on. This is why this is what messes people up because they come in here and they're expecting this. Today <laughs> we will all be reading scripture. And they always have creepy their eyes always go all over the place and it's just creepy. <laughs> Versus you coming in here and I'm just like you. I have bad days and good days. I've got bad hair days and good hair days, whatever. I'm just saying there is no reason for somebody to put on the airs and say, now, I have arrived here. You all have to catch up to me if you can. It doesn't work like that either. So God's looking at the big picture, which is why I'm desperately wanting to kind of maybe have you a sneak peek into the New Testament because in the New Testament, Peter says it really well. He says, your royal priesthood, speaking of the whole body of believers, he no longer says there is it. He doesn't say there is a priesthood and it's the select, frozen, chosen, special people who have no sin in their life and they're perfect and they were dedicated and whatever else. He's saying the whole body of believers, a royal, holy priesthood, a holy nation, yes, He's speaking to those dispersed part of that diaspora, but I'm telling you something. He speaks to us, and the same thing that is true of those people he was writing to is true for us. It is now the transition that has been made is that God has called some people, and he has set some apart, and he has said, I want these people. And for all those people out there, by the way, that are equally confused about the brouhaha over Israel and all of the politics and all of the fighting, let me just say this to you. A lot of people don't like this, and the Bible talks about the chosen people, and then people turn around and say, well, you know, but that's, not, that's not happening like that anymore. Well, you know, listen, if you're reading the whole book, the whole book tells me that God still has a great affection for the people of Israel and the state of Israel, and you're saying, how did I get to this? Why? Because at some point he said, this is a wholly chosen people. Now, that doesn't mean... When, when people will get in there, it doesn't mean that holy chosen people is referencing, watch it, the Jews, because it's not. It's referencing Israel. And there, we've gone through this before. There's a difference between all Israel and all Jews. So w- when we talk about a holy people set apart, he didn't say the Judahites do you like it better that way? Does it come across better that way? Because that's where the name Jew comes from. It doesn't come from some derogatory invention of the English language. It comes from the word tribe of Judah, Jew, Judahite, Yudahi. So would you like it better if I said, let's talk about all of Yehuda, all of the people, all of the tribe, all of the bodies compassing Yehuda, and not, if you're going to talk about it that way, that was a tribe. If you're going to talk about it as, as a group of religious people, This is the thing that always gets homogenized. No one will separate and get straight because it is in the end times that we understand that the lost tribes, and we know, we already know now, the lost tribes are not lost. And God set apart some people. He set them apart. He said, these are my people, which in the end, those same people will resurface. I'm not talking about the exact same people here, but the tribes of those people, as the book of Revelation tells me and tells you, they'll be these preachers of righteousness, 144,000 of them to be exact, 
and it is within the confines of that that we see they never, these people that God chose never stopped being chosen people. He just parked it for a time. Even John 17, when he says, other, I have other sheep, other sheep that, um, he says here, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So even in that prayer, there's something that might be a little bit cryptic saying, I got these people over here, but there might be other people over here, which could be referring back to the Jews, could be referring to any group of people. But when God says, this is set apart, this nation is set apart, the book confirms that. We don't have to, you don't have to like it, you don't have to agree with it, the book confirms it. The other thing that is, because I'm on this subject and I don't even know how I got here, uh, <laughs> but while we're on this subject where people talk about and say things regarding, um, we'll call them fallacies of the Bible, uh, the things that people would like to perpetuate as truth, we have uh, an incredible uh, connection, America, with Israel, and it's not what people think. It has much to do, again, with this body of people that supposedly disappears, which then becomes re- referenced as lost, which is not lost because if you think about it, how did the people, don't talk to me about first peoples or native peoples, how did the people get to America? They came to America on the... Mayflower, those people were escaping religious persecution. Those people were originally coming from a place of they want to practice their faith. But those people from England, England, which was several other tribes, you can keep tracing this back to find out that we are inextricably as a country tied to Israel. And unfortunately, in the political climate where people use that as a, as a, a, a tool and they don't understand what this book says, they sound like a bunch of morons. Okay, sorry. Yes, you know, if you, if you want to say something, educate yourself. I wouldn't want to be, um, for example, taking medicine that one of these people formulated because their formulation might include, uh, you know, we, we, you have cancer, we're going to give you Rice Krispie pills because they'll make you better. Because that's how ignorant some of these people are. So when I say that, speak the truth in love, I just did that as well for people saying, well, what's the deal with that? The deal is we're tied with those people. And don't say, well, why do we have to support them or get rid of them? Why? Because we actually happen to be one. This is not one world, but this is one body of people. And until people get that straight, it'll become clear, by the way, when you get to the book of Revelation. But I'm back to the chosen holy people, which the church now makes up. And to be a saint, which I said the reference is, I'd like to put a challenge for you. In um, the book of Psalms, let me count them real quick. It looks to me like there may be there may be all but possibly 30 references in the book of Psalms entirely. And actually, I may give you those on festival. We may do a, a little bit of a word study on festival. But my point for today is this, because I have to bring this to a close. What I feel is the big revelation for today is that we have, although we did not examine the references out of Psalm in detail, we're seeing a change, which is what I described at the beginning, from ceremony and from this kind of we are applying, we are doing, to now in the Psalms, it is the bulk of the references are to God and any references to the saints, they're called just that, the saints. As we progress, there'll be more and more references to God less and less references about us. And I think the clarity obviously comes when you get into the New Testament. So what about this, this subject? How, how can we get now to the point of saying, okay, we've talked about sanctification, we've talked about holy and holiness. How can we get better clarity? Well, what I am going to do, it'll be on festival. I don't want to do it here because I'd like to jump into the New Testament and really kind of crack open the egg of application now. We've got enough stuff. You can pick up the pieces in your spare time if you feel so inclined to do. But I'd like for us to get into the New Testament and start kind of peeling back the layers of clarity because in the New Testament, we don't have the ambiguity that we were dealing with in the Old Testament. But if there is something that I'd like you to take away today It definitely is this. Do not let anyone put you or your faith or the way you practice your faith 
in, in some type of box. Because I'm going to be honest, when I look out at the congregation here and most of the people that I've met, we're all earthy, right? Yes, ma'am. I mean, please, if, if you're a non-earthy person, I invite you to leave. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about real stuff here. I've got people in, it's, it's, heart, it's actually heartbreaking for me. When I say earthy, that's a way of making it light, but it's kind of heavy because you see people around you who have a sickness and they've got, mm, well, you all know what the definition of feisty is? Not, not, not the kind that you use, but the feisty as we've defined it in, in other days here. Yes? So when I say earthy, I'm talking about people who don't pass themselves off as, I'm some Puritan somewhere, I'm a holy person, I'm this. We, we all, even in talking to each other, we can just be ourselves, we can just be real, and have, we'll call it the fellowship of believers that the Bible talks about, and not have this uh, pecking society that says, you know, I'm... Look at me, and I, I don't do this, and I don't do that. Hey, listen, I got a bunch of people here. You were listening. I got a bunch of people here in, in front of me that they live. And that's part of being a Christian. You don't stop living to be a Christian. As you grow, you realize not all things are profitable. Not Like Paul said, not all things are going to be expedient or good for you, but you, you may do them. And then so, at some point, you get down the road and you decide, Maybe I don't even like that, or maybe I don't like that behavior, or maybe I don't like this habit. But that, that becomes something between you and God. I'm no longer interested, like the person that said, please pray for me. You know, people say I can't be a Christian because I'm a smoker. This was a person that wrote to me about a year or two ago. And all of their friends are constantly harassing them. You know, their, their whole life is the cigarette. And I basically just said, hey, if you want to shorten your life, be my guest. It doesn't make you less of a Christian. And some other person might say, well, your job as a pastor is to tell that person that that's not, that's, this is a temple, and we need to put good things in the temple. Well, friend, I'm going to tell you something. I spend a lot of time taking care of the temple, and no matter how much care I take of the temple, I still don't take care of it like to the point where somebody will say, well, even if somebody eats good food, well, there's contaminants, there's pollution. So when I said to you, don't stop living. We have an earthy congregation. Don't change how you are. Let God, if there's going to be a change, let him change you. You came in the door one way. Let, let it be the testament that you can sit back 10, 20, or 30 years down the road and say, no doubt about it, because I, I was set on my course. God definitely entered in. He not only stopped me in my tracks and saved me, that's justification, for my faith, but the changes that have happened in me, I didn't try to make them. God did it. That's when you can turn around and you give God the glory because he, he did this thing. I didn't, I didn't ask God, hey God, will you do this thing for me? But it was in my heart, so obviously that may be a silent petition, I don't know. And as I kept praying about something and kept praying about something and kept praying about it, God, it's like the change or the the moment where I say, God did that. I know God did that. That's what the church and the body of believers should be about, not about this exterior, I've, I've referred to it, hanging the fruit on the tree, because somebody says, a Christian ought to look like that. Or, you know, you've heard other people say things like, well, you know, if you, were, if you were really saved, then they'll fill in the blanks. You know, I'm, I have no problem. Somebody wants to, um, you know, try and do an analysis of somebody, but no one can know the heart of the individual. Only God can know that. And that's when we have been set apart by God. That is the one thing I can tell you. That's not these add-ons. It's not the perfection. It is definitely this. And as I said, coming into the Psalms, please study them in your own time. When you start to see the change, you realize that there is this, man is seeing the separation, the great separation. It's sin that's made the separation between man and God, and the separation is getting even bigger and bigger, and yet God still deigns in his holiness to speak to a man like David and to speak to 
an Abraham or a Moses or a Jacob or to bend down from on high and save a Melissa Scott or you put your name in there. So if somebody says to me, what does it look like? How does it feel? How does somebody know? This isn't like, oh, it's some mystical, mysterious thing. This is the process of walking by faith, staying in the word and recognizing that sometime down the road you are going to look back. And if you, if you haven't done it already, you're going to look back and you're going to say, I can't believe, fill in the blanks, You've already, I know some of you have already done it, I can't believe that. You have any, any one of you ever said that? Like looking back, 20 years ago, I used to fill in the blanks, whatever it is, I can't believe, look where I am now. And it's not like you're anything great or you've arrived or you're perfect. It's none of that. It's just looking back and noticing something you did not initiate. Is that anybody's experience in this room? Well, then, thank you, Lord, that I finally accomplished the purpose of saying when God wants you, he's not going to wrestle you against your will, but when he has called you and set you apart, he will begin a work And by the way, he will finish it too. It's a long process, but hold on, folks. There is way more. If you'll be patient, I will continue on the subject. But right now, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com. 